Success uh, for me means uh, achieving excellence for yourself, but what's more important for me is uh, significance, that uh, when we are making others in society better, making sure that they, they are successful, it's not only about yourself, because especially in an organization, you have to mobilize the organization to be more successful, and an organization is no more than an accumulation of people. So the more you empower people and you make them effective, the more successful you will be. I trained as an accountant at, uh, at, at Price, Price Otter House, as it was call, called then. And uh, I, I quite enjoyed it and uh, but you really start from the bottom from the basics uh, to sometimes if we we are not busy the audit senior would give you a telephone directory to say add the telephone numbers and practice your editions <laughs> so so you might have taken it badly but it was quite a character building and, and humbling and then you you'd grow to be audit senior and uh, assistant audit manager and then i 1993, I then transferred from uh, uh, Price Waterhouse in Zimbabwe to Price Waterhouse in, uh, in, in, in Durban. I then transitioned from there and moved to a company called Columbus Stainless initially in, uh, in Middlebeck. And uh, at that point in time, it was the world's biggest single site stainless steel company. I joined as a corporate accountant, which is a where you're saying we need you, but we do not know what for. But uh, I did lots of jobs, but I, I quite enjoyed it, from project accounting to treasury to controllership. Actually, from an accounting perspective, I probably had the most solid and uh, broad training there. And uh, the, there was a gentleman called uh, Iqbal, who used to be my manager at Price Hotels. He was now the controller there, so he was also a, a mentor for for me, and at Price Waterhouse, Stanley Supremani, who later became the deputy chief executive of, uh, of, of, of Price Waterhouse, also had a strong influence uh, in my career. Uh, thereafter, I joined uh, uh, Shell uh, as the treasurer in, uh, in Southern Africa, which is basically Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique coming down. I then uh, was uh, fairly successful, I would say, because I, for two years running uh, around 2000, I got the award of Corporate Treasurer of the Year in South Africa. Uh, thereafter, I went to, to Netherlands and uh, to the UK uh, to, to be groomed to be CFO. Errol Marshall, I got uh, Blaise's soul, was the chairman of, 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 uh, of Shell. He gave me a leg up to say he was uh, tired of 30 years of expatriates coming to, to South Africa and staying in Bishop's Court of Constantia and being paid a hardship allowance. <laughs> so he, 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 he then decided that I'd be given a chance and I'm eternally grateful to him. So I, I worked in, in, in the UK and... Uh, in, in the Netherlands, and uh, the amazing first experience in the UK, for those of you who've been there, is uh, you use the tube a lot. So I get into the tube and uh, I greet these ladies next to me. And they, and they look at me funny as to what's your problem, because uh, in, in my culture it's, it's, it's very rude not to to greet people next to you, because it means, uh, if you greet somebody, it means, uh, I'm not a threat to you, and I welcome you. But uh, in that culture, it means don't invade my space. So the newspapers went, <laughs> So when I related the story at work, they said, no, 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 you don't greet people. Just get on with your work. <laughs> so we led every day. So whilst I was at Shell, so initially I was, I, I was the treasurer there and public officer, but uh, I then uh, got promoted to the role of, of CFO which was uh, now much uh, quite, quite broader because I was now in a le le leadership uh, position at a fairly young age for a company that size. I was uh, 30, 36 years old uh, at, the at the time. So I was uh, 
part of the executive committee, but not only was I looking at uh, the finance function, uh, but I had to look at the corporate as a whole and managing it. And one of the earlier roles in, in my position was uh, negotiating an empowerment transaction with uh, Tebe, which uh, fortunately, years after, even when I had left, uh, it looks like it has gone from strength to strength. And not only did they buy the the retail side of the business, but uh, they've since uh, bought the rest of the portfolio also of uh, Shell as their empowerment partner, even on the re refining side. So that was a good leadership experience to say, how can I make the company more effective and resilient and what leadership role do, do I play? Because now I'm not just a managing a function, I'm part of managing a company. So then the, the, the role then changes because you, uh, as you become uh, more senior, you, you, there is more fluidity and unpredictability which uh, doesn't come naturally to finance people, but uh, I had to cope with that. And uh, my exposure abroad and uh, my exposure also in doing an, an MBA, especially within international business schools, helped prepare me, me for, for, for that. So I worked very well with the, with, with, with the chairman at the time, Errol Marshall, and uh, they, thereafter they converted it to be a more global company. So we were working with our colleagues in, in, in London. We formed a Pan-African uh, Shell uh, organization in uh, 2001, 2002. So there was a lot of traveling there. So that was that. And then uh, in a multinational like Shell, you, you move every th three to four years. So my next assignment uh, was going to be possibly to move to, to Nigeria. And, uh, but at that time, we had a two-year-old two uh, uh, son, and uh, maybe my wife was not too keen on, 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 on that, but uh, maybe she should have been, I should have marketed it more, because actually, as expatriates, you, you live in a more protected in environment, be that as it may, I I then was a headhunted to be CFO at uh, at ESCOM, the power utility. I didn't know that they were they'd been looking for a for a CFO for for almost a year, because I was a succeeding a gentleman called uh, Dr. Cock who. who who was extremely strong, especially in the treasury, and he had written uh, treasury books. So they had told the chairman, uh, Royal Cosa, and the chief executive at the time, uh, Tuladi Kaba, she was now chairman of Standard Bank, to say you have zero chance of finding a, a black chartered accountant with treasury experience. So eventually they, 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 they found me, and uh, uh, it's pretty sad for me what has since happened to to ESCOM, I'll come to that shortly. But uh, it obviously was a, a, a very big job. I, I joined on the 8th of uh, August 2004. So the, the numbers were, 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 were colossal there because although Shell was, was big, uh, ESCOM was, was, was much, much bigger. So I had uh, still a portfolio in finance, which had the usual suspects of uh, controlling treasury. Treasury was very big there because you had to raise uh, billions and billions of, 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 of dollars in, in funding. And then I had uh, in insurance as well and, and tax, uh, corporate finance and, and, and so on. And uh, I came there at a transitional period because before then, uh, ESCOM had not been uh, allowed to build power station because there was going to be a move to privatization. But uh, thereafter, there was a move to to make sure that uh, the, the power shortage is imminent. And uh, then, uh, actually, the former chief executive, Tulani Tabashe, they had gone to see the government at the time of, uh, of uh, President Begi to say we're going to run short of... Uh, peak power by 2008, and then will run out of base capacity by 2010. But at that time, there was excess capacity, so they were told, what are you smoking? You have got three power stations closed. Now you want to build new, new power stations. What's, what's your problem? 
but uh, they done long term planning, which uh, which was obviously quite 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 robust. Which is the the moral of the story for that is uh, listen to the experts, and uh, the experts say uh, know, know what they are doing. So it's pretty tragic when uh, years after I left ESCOM in uh, end of two thousand and eight. It's pretty tragic when I see what subsequently happened. So I've been reflecting a lot as to what happened to such a great organization, which in 2001 was the power utility of the year, and suddenly all this happened. It's, uh, it's all about uh, leadership and governance, because when leadership and governance are in place, people think these are overrated concepts. But when you suddenly don't have leadership and the governance, you don't have things just collapse in a horrible way and there is no better case study than uh, than than it than it is gone. but I, I, I hope they'll get it right now I joined uh, Amplats the uh, in uh, platinum group metals and uh, at that time in January 2009 uh, it was one of the leading companies within the 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 anglo stables because the PGM, so the Platinum Group Metals, which is, is your Platinum and your Palladium and Rhodium, the prices were rather high and the rand had been uh, rather weak, so the, the, the performance had, uh, had been very good. I joined because they had a vacancy for a CFO because the CFO had been promoted, uh, Norman Bazima had been promoted to, to, be, to, to be chief executive at, 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 at Kumba. Uh, so, so that, that's that's how I I ended up uh, uh, there. The big learning for me when I joined uh, uh, Anglo American Platinum, there were eighty thousand employees, and then uh, the price started coming down, and then there were then labor issues of AMCU, and then there was a huge turmoil in in, in in the industry. So by the time I left in in February 2014, the 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 headcount was was down to fifty thousand. And uh, I suppose it's 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 even lower now. So there I learned a lot about uh, managing a crisis and, and the leadership. And uh, you all know what happened in, in, in Americana. Uh, we, we didn't have uh, all the many medals uh, at, at, at Anglo, but uh, at the same time, we faced all the adversity and intimidation which uh, Lon Min had faced. So initially, we had a strike of, uh, of uh, three months in 2012, and the next year, we then had a five-month strike. So it's not nice to say fortunately, but uh, we then had the opportunity to plan as a scenario to say this might come. So what do we do? So we then, uh, the strategy was to get closer, to get closer to your employees because uh, what had happened with the domination previously of uh, NUM being seen as a responsible union, management were, were not engaging directly with the employees because they would uh, have faith and trust that NUM will do that to the employees. But uh, with the coming of uh, AMCU, uh, then uh, they were basically dislodged because it means they were out of touch. So they were not connecting uh, with the employees. And uh, as an expert in communication, uh, you would know better that if you can't connect, you can't communicate. <laughs> so you need to connect before you, you communicate. So that was a big learning to say, get closer to your employees, know what are their grievances and proactively deal with them. Know what are the societal issues as well, be closer to the communities, and then uh, build your inventory. So we built our inventory. We, we actually, for all the five months we had the strike, uh, all our customers got their supply of platinum because we had adequately planned. But it was quite a terrifying experience at, at some point in time because the chief executive, uh, uh, Chris Griffiths, rightfully say, asked me to be the crisis uh, manager. So every morning, seven days a week, we would have a call at eight to say what is the situation, what do we do, and what do we do. 
And my big learning in uh, managing a, a crisis is uh, almost always management and leadership, they underestimate the crisis. It helped me when I was, when I'm now at, uh, at, at Sasol, where, where I am now, because we also had a, a, a strike, because I then had to say, you need to prepare for, for a long road. It's not going to be a short road. So preparation and preparation is everything. And knowing your stakeholders, and, uh, but engaging and engaging directly, and having discipline in, in, in your processes, because uh, I, I'm could typically would want to deal with the chief executives. And that, by definition, disempowers the people in, in, in the field. So you, you need to walk a tightrope to make sure that uh, you deal with the crisis without disempowering uh, your people. So a big learning in crisis management, as, as I say, is prepare, 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 and then uh, overestimate because the crisis is likely to be bigger than you, you, you think. The big learning also, uh, when, when I was at uh, Anglo, is the relationship between the CFO and, uh, and the CO, because you really need to be joined at the hip uh, to, to support, but also to challenge at, at the same time. And you need a CEO who's in a secure base. Uh, I was fortunate enough that I was working with, say, uh, uh, Chris Griffith, who's, who's still the CEO at, at the time, uh, who's usually mis 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 misunderstood. Some people might be afraid of him, but because he's detail-focused and he's execution-focused. But he has no time for fools, maybe right, rightfully so. But if you, you challenge him with facts and you give him all the relevant information, he's prepared to change his position. But uh, also because I would challenge him on some issues with a very great rapport. So I, I eventually left to, to come to Sasol now, but uh, there's, there's no issue with, 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 with our relationship because it was a trust relationship which we built. Uh, but uh, to, to be, he called me a wingman <laughs> in, 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 in how we worked together, that we challenge each other but support each, each other. So it's important to work that way, but also bring the other uh, exco ex colleagues and more importantly bring the organization uh, w with you. It's all about uh, mobilizing people because uh, it's not about you, it's about the organization. My joining of... Uh, Oh, of, of Sasol was a, it, rather in a roundabout way because I initially joined as a non-executive director because I told the chairman and the headhunter that uh, I'm, I'm tired of being a, a CFO. I've been a CFO for 15 years, but uh, un, unless if there's opportunities for, for growth, uh, I would rather maybe just save them on the board and stay where I am. Because at the time I was also in a non-executive director at Old Mutual PLC in London, but the travels uh, were, were, were getting to me. So I wanted to be a non-executive director in a substantial company, but rather nearby. So I joined as a non-executive director at, 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 at Sasol. And after a few months, the chairman then said to me, we have continued with our search, but... Uh, and the more we search and the more we engage with you, we, we think we are the most appropriate person to be, to be CF, CFO. But uh, I said, we have had this conversation. <laughs> I'm tired of being a CFO. I just want a, a route to elsewhere, you said. And then he then said to me, well, I can't promise anything. I said, no, I don't need any promises. But uh, if you come in, you will gain more credibility by demonstrating your effectiveness as a leader, as an executive who is here every day than as a non-executive who comes every three months. So, so I couldn't argue with that. <laughs> so so I, 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 I then joined uh, as, as a C CFO. Uh, David Constable was, was the president and CEO at the time. And... Uh, then uh, there was then the crisis in October 2014 of uh, the oil prices came down from the 120 down to 50. At its lowest, uh, the next year it was down to 27. So it was quite a calamity. And then the break-even price of, the, of, of, uh, of, of Sasol used to be $70 per barrel, 
but we had to see how we survive when when the break even is 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 lower than that. So, so I then had to see, oh, gee, just my luck. When when will I have an easy job? <laughs> so, 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 but uh, it it was quite revealing, and your all your earlier years of training and dealing with fluidity and dealing with difficulty prepares for, for you for that because you methodically uh, deal with the issues as to what am I in control of, what can I solve, because you need to just focus on the issues you can control or influence. The rest will come for you. You'll have to manage the tailwinds and, and headwinds. So there was already a rationalization going on at uh, Sasol at the time, uh, because as David Constable used to call it, is is uh, fix the roof whilst the sun is shining, so that when it rains, at least we are prepared. So it was uh, insightful to do that. But with the big fall in, in price, that was not good enough. So we then started a, a response plan, which was more cash conservation. So for instance, we then uh, stopped the gas to liquids plant we were going to build in, in, in the USA, although we continued with the Lake Charles chemical project, uh, which we have. We then rescheduled some of the projects which we had uh, around the world because cash, cash was, was everything. And uh, the wonderful thing, though, is uh, people at Sasol have a wonderful can-do attitude. You can have views about them, about anything else, but you can't fault them for execution and getting things done. So everybody was focused on these two we, sh we shall conquer. So the break-even price for the company in terms of uh, crude oil, it came down from $70 per barrel to the 35 now. So even at $40 per barrel, we can operate quite profitably and, and, and be successful. So all that happened. Initially, I was CFO, and then uh, David Constable, unfortunately, had to uh, move on because he didn't want to renew his contract because for family reasons, his family wanted him closer to, to them in, 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 the U, in the USA. So then the process then started to, to recruit a, a, a CEO. They were not recruiting for a joint CEO, as Steve and I always say it. So I, I said, oh, it's, it's a bit earlier than I anticipated, but anyway, let's, I'll put my, 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 my name in the, in, in the head. So I, I then went through the, the processes and then the, the outcome is the outcome. And uh, they told us that the, the, they will finalize the appointment in, in, uh, in February of 2016. But in, in 2015, after the board meeting, because I was, a, I was a board member as a CFO, the chairman then said he wants to see me with the non-executive director. So what have I done now? <laughs> because it was not in my mind that they made this uh, this decision. So he then uh, said, "Well, uh, the nominations committee and board would like to offer you a role as a joint president and, and CEO of 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 Sasol." I said, "Wow." <laughs> That, that's interesting. I said, they said it's joint. Are you prepared to accept it in, in a joint role? I said, uh, t talk to me about why it's joint. They then explained that uh, when they analyzed the profiles of uh, all the candidates, uh, St Steve Cornell and, and myself who complemented each other quite, quite well, both in personalities and then in, 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 in skill set. And then I said, well, it depends who is the, <laughs> the other joint uh, uh, CEO. And then when he said Steve, I said, uh, oh, that's, that's great then. Because Steve, although he was based in the, in the USA, uh, ironically, a CFO, I'd been involved with him in co-solving some of the challenges we were facing as a company. And I worked quite, 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 quite well with him. What fascinated uh, Steve and I in preparation for being a joint CEO is uh, the headhunter which had helped uh, uh, Sasol at the time gave us material as to how to prepare for this and uh, how to make this successful. So we went all this material over the weekend and all of it said it's fails, egos, 
unsustainable and so, 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 so this, this, this is fascinating so you, you, you are appointing us as joint CEO and you give us all this reading that uh, it's a uh, it, it never works and truly 90% of the time it never works and why does it not work because people in our positions normally have got inflated egos and it's all about me 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 but uh, with Steve and I, obviously you never get to this position with a level without an ego of sorts. But you need to have a manageable, balanced ego. So S S Steve and myself have got that. And then the other thing we agreed this with Steve is, is that the ways of working. You put the company first, you put the team second, and you put the individuals third. So once we are focused like that, uh, chances are everybody will know what's best for the company. Because if you reverse it and put the individuals first, it will be what is my ego trip. For instance, I might say I want to build the biggest plant ever built by Sasso. But that's not necessarily the most viable or the most strategic into the future. But if you calmly look at uh, what's best for Sasol and what are the mega trends going into the future like we did when we did our strategy review last year, you hardly disagree on anything of substance. The only thing we debate is who's flying earlier to London because <laughs> we, we can't fly together. But uh, 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 other than that, it, it works. It, we also had to work with our colleagues, uh, the, the group executive team, so-called the GEC, because even earlier before our appointment in, uh, in April, we went on uh, off-site and we agreed on ways of working because this was also intriguing them as to, but if I have a problem, whom do I go to and so on and so, so this is all confusing. But uh, the, the, the board had been quite uh, smart in designing how, how it will work. Because normally in a bank, for instance, they would split responsibilities be between investment banking and, and retail banking. Uh, in our case, it's smartly meshed together. So I'll take our executive who looks after operations globally. So uh, Bernard would re report to Steve for operations in, in, in Southern Africa, and uh, he would uh, report to me for operations offshore. So, and then we have a bi-monthly uh, with, uh, with, with, with the executives every other six or to eight weeks, and we do that together. So as much as possible, we co-create and, and do things together. We are, our offices are next to each other, and just by mere fluke and coincidence, he stays in the na same neighborhood I stay in, and uh, his daughter is not only at the same school, he's in the same class with my, with my daughter. Even this year, I notice when they change classes, they are in the same class. So that's, that's a fate, uh, I suppose. So it's, it's, it's working quite well, but uh, it's, it, ultimately it's about personalities and uh, how, you, how you, you, you make it work. So St Steve and I would write to, like to write a case study of uh, the 10% how to make it successful in joint leadership. For me, what's, impos what's important is that uh, as a leader, first of all, you need to have a lot of credibility. You need to know your business and you need to be an eth ethical person. Treat people with respect and then they will respect you because I don't believe personally that people should uh, respect uh, you because of the position. They should respect you because of the individual, because the individuals ca come, come and go. So it, it, it's important that. The other thing which is quite important is as a leader, you should create clarity of what's our vision, what's our mission, where we're going. And then the commitment to drive the people. So that, that has worked for me a, a lot. So you need to do that because all studies have shown that uh, successful people, there is a common trait for successful people. They obviously need to be competent. 
uh, but they need to be, have the confidence also. But the third element is credibility, which more depends on the external view rather than your own internal uh, locus. So once you combine those, it, 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 it normally works. Where we have been un, un, unstable, for instance, in state-owned enterprises, besides the leadership and governance, which I talked to, is if you look at these three C's I talked about, competence has been variable, credibility has been variable, confidence might have been there, but misguided. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, uh, we need the right people in the, in the right places. I happen to believe that uh, government should uh, create the enabling environment for business to operate, and then uh, business should uh, manage businesses successfully for profit. Profit is not a four-letter word. <laughs> profit is necessary for growth, not only for the company, but also for broader society, because profit gives you optionality. Now, if although you have private companies also, in state-owned enterprises, I certainly believe others might have a, a much more extreme view that there is a role for state-owned enterprises as long as they are run properly. Because if you go to the extreme of a privatization like uh, happened un under Mike Margaret Thatcher, there is a risk that the infrastructure might begin to flounder because people, there is over-focus on profit and they're not replacing uh, the, the infrastructure or the cost of the service is, is way and above uh, the, the aver average in the individual. So there is room for both as long as uh, things are being done properly. Last year as business and uh, with, uh, with government, we, we worked on the CO initiative. Uh, Praveen Gordon was the Minister of Finance uh, uh, at, at the time, but then there was then the Night of Long Knives uh, when there was a cabinet reshuffle and all that changed. So that became difficult because we then saw, saw the downgrades in South Africa and also the cohesion and cooperation which was there between business and government started floundering. But uh, that's not good for South Africa because uh, Yes, we need to succeed as business, but we need to be aware of what our societal responsibilities as well. Because I'm not only responsible for my shareholders, I'm responsible for the broader stakeholders. Uh, I unashamedly say that to, to the shareholders as well. Because without the support of your stakeholders, you can't run a successful business and you cannot deliver. So, if in South Africa, given our history, we need to deal with, with the needs of, uh, of, of transformation because uh, we come from a history of uh, racial segregation which we cannot uh, wish away. But the issue is how do we deal with, with, with it in a very constructive way because in the companies we deal with it every day to say this is not about making the lives of our white employees difficult. This is about creating opportunities for the greater populace so that it's not only for the greater good of the company, for the greater good of society and increases the sustainability of, of, of our operations. The narrative has greatly changed since the ANC NASREC conference in, in, in December. So we have reconvened as the CEO uh, initiative, working together with, with, with government, with a common narrative, because the challenges we face in South Africa are not different to the rest of the world. For instance, the theme at Davos this year is a shared future in a fractured world. You, you could delete the world, the world and put South Africa, it's still applicable. So how do we work with it? Because uh, we need not talk about uh, too much about uh, be, 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 believing in uh, ideology, but seeing how can we be solution focused. Because everybody, nobody wakes up every day, be it a worker, a unionist, a politician, a business person. Nobody wakes up every morning and saying, I want to make South Africa a worse place today. Everybody wakes up to say, how can I make South Africa better, how can I make the world better? 
So this newfound cooperation and enthusiasm is important. It's even more important that there have been early demonstrated options to deal with issues such as debt capture and corruption, be it in business or in private sector. But it's important to sustain it and to make sure that we deliver because damage has been done. It's not going to be easy and quick to deal with it. But hey, as I said to my colleague at the CEO initiative, how old is your company? If your company is 100 years old, or in our case it's 67 years old, this too shall pass. You need, your job as a leader is to manage uh, all the big issues. Some will be good, some will be bad. You, you will walk, go past this. But uh, I'm very confident that uh, South Africa, uh, all of us deal with adversity and go past the difficult elements. So this too shall pass and there will be a, yet again the marvel of the world. <laughs>